Well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming together for the fifth episode of the Noon Demon Live series. Uh, we're really grateful to have all of you join us for this hour, and we hope everyone is staying safe. And um, I'm Sarah Darius. I am the incoming recess editor of the Chronicle. Uh, recess is the Chronicle's arts and culture section. Um, and I guess most recently, I participated in Duke of Los Angeles. Um, yeah. Shall I introduce myself? Okay, uh, hi, I'm Eva. I'm a rising senior, also at Recess, incoming campus art editor. Um, have, been re have been with Recess since freshman year. Um, I'm studying public policy uh, economics and also getting a certificate in Arts of the Moving Image. Oh, I guess I should mention I'm studying literature and getting a certificate in Arts of the Moving Image. Um, yeah, so uh, please note that we're recording this Zoom session to post on the Demon Web. Um, we'd like to extend a special thank you to Duke in LA, Duke in New York, Duke Arts, the Chronicle, and Recess for collaborating. Um, we received do dozens of questions submitted by students and alumni, so uh, we won't be taking live for this episode, um, but if you have any pressing questions, do feel free to drop them in the comments if you'd like to address them. Um, and we'll post the panelists' emails in the chat so that you can follow up with them directly. Yeah. And to kick off this panel, uh, we first like to go around and have each panelist introduce themselves. And we'll just go in the order I see here because it's random order everyone's at, everyone's in. So why don't we start with Marie? I graduated from Duke in 2001. Um, I think your, I think the audio is a little, we can't really hear you. Um. Hello, can you hear oh, me? Yeah, it works okay. now. All right, I'll, um, so my name's Maureen Farrell. I graduated in 01 and um, I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I cover IPOs and capital markets. I'm actually currently on a uh, sabbatical. I'm, writing a book right now on WeWork um, that should come out in 2021. And I'll be back full time at the journal in the fall. Oh, uh, Marco, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, hi, um, everybody can hear me? Okay, yeah. Uh, Marco Werman, um, I graduated Duke uh, 1983, uh, currently host and uh, executive editor of the world from uh, PRX, the public radio, uh, public radio exchange is produced at WGBH in Boston. Um, executive editor basically means that I write a lot of the show and uh, I get to change anything right at the last minute because it has to come out of my mouth, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That's great. Um, next, we have Ken. Hi, uh, I'm Ken Bensinger. I'm class of 1997. Um, and I am currently a reporter on the investigations team at uh, BuzzFeed News. Um, and I wrote a book uh, called Red Card about the FIFA uh, sort of soccer corruption scandal that was big news a few years ago. Um, that came out in 2018. Um, so, and I live in LA. That's pretty much my story. Wonderful. Must be great weather down there. It's hot. It's like, it was like 95 degrees today. We're all whining. About I'd it. love that coming from Canada. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's got, there's plenty of lizards around here <laughs> like those. Um, next we have Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Henry. I graduated in Duke um, in 94. I um, currently work at CNN where I'm the regional news gathering director for news in the Southeast. So we cover news from, we, you know, we cover news from as far north as North Carolina, and then we cover, you know, what would be considered the traditional South, and we stop at Louisiana. So it's been a very interesting 10 weeks um, for me um, in covering um, all that's going on with coronavirus, and um, I'm very proud to say that I um, am, I'm also a Duke parent, in addition of for being a Duke alum, and my son is a rising senior, so he's class of 21. 
A class of 21. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we have Mark. Uh, hi, I am a uh, class of 1992. Um, I, uh, I'm actually a Durham native. I grew up, I was born and raised in Durham. Um, and, uh, and I live now in New York where I'm a producer uh, at 60 Minutes. And I produce for correspondent Bill Whitaker. And glad to be here. Lucky to have you here. Um, and Mangesh, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. I, I graduated uh, 2001 from Duke. I, uh, um, when I was there, I, I started a, a magazine called Mental Floss and a website. And so I, I did that for, for a while. And, and now I, uh, I head up podcast development at iHeartMedia. Great. Um, next, Maria. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm class of 2008, and I'm the author of the novel Oksana Behave, which is a coming-of-age immigrant story, and um, I am an assistant professor at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama, which is where I am. Great. <laughs> hi. And um, Danielle, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi. I'm Danielle Janae. I'm a class of 2012 graduate. I'm currently a producer at Good Morning America, and I produce for Robin Roberts, and I'm in New York, New York City. Sounds great. Um, Sarah, would you like to go next? Sure. I think I'm the only Sarah, hopefully, which would be rare, but I'll go. <laughs> um, I'm Sarah Kruger. I graduated from Duke in 2012, and I'm currently getting a master's part-time in the liberal studies program and I am the Durham reporter for WRAL TV, which is the NBC affiliate here in the Triangle. Awesome. And Winston? Hi, everyone. Uh, Winston Wild. I'm a Duke 2008 uh, public policy major. I'm based out of Washington, DC, and most recently, uh, currently, uh, I work for NBC News's unit covering the president, the White House unit. Great. I think I have everyone introducing themselves, not missing anyone. Awesome. Well, I guess we can go ahead and get started with the questions then. Um, the first question is for Danielle and for Marina. Um, let's talk about your journey from Duke to your current career. Uh, what are some ways that you applied your Duke experience to your current job? Uh, what opportunities do you suggest that students take advantage of? Um, at Duke, both virtually and when back on campus? Sure, so I'll, I'll take this <laughs> one. Um, so I did the Duke in New York program. I don't know if any of you are um, planning on doing it or have done it, but I highly recommend it, um, especially if you're interested in the arts and media world. Um, it's a really good um, for me, it was a really good introduction um, because part of your education is to have an internship. And so that was the first opportunity I had in television. So um, I'm sure you'll hear, hear it throughout the panel tonight, but internships are really key um, in this world. Um, oh, hi, Jane. Um, and so I interned at Inside Edition and, you know, started to think, okay, maybe I could do this. And I, when I got back at Duke, um, I had another internship at a local affiliate there at the ABC affiliate. Um, so again, internships, but also on, cam on campus. Um, I'll also give a shout out to Duke Student Broadcasting. Um, that was really instrumental. Uh, the Chronicle, anything you could do to get hands on work wherever you are, um, you know, especially now, however you can contribute, um, writing, uh, shooting, um, whatever you can do, um, I would really encourage that. Um, and then post-college, I started at the assignment desk at ABC News, where I worked the overnight shift um, in the breaking news department, which was a really good overview of what it looks like to work in the breaking news world. And from there, um, you know, networking is also very key. Talk to people, start figuring out um, what are you interested in. Um, so another thing you could do now is, of course, take calls. Um, call people, learn about what they do, um, and from there kind of, you know, figure out, can I, can, can I raise my hand? Can I help out? Um, it's very much a yes, um, I could do it. What can I do? How can I help? How can I contribute? Um, and so from there, I just kind of worked my way um, up to producer, so in a nutshell. 
Um, yeah, so one important thing I did at Duke was um, I did the Duke Study Abroad in St. Petersburg program. And as an immigrant from Ukraine, um, that really got me just interested in my heritage and in writing about it. And so that kind of complemented all the creative writing classes that I took at Duke. And um, just my mentors there were really important to me, like Faulkner Fox, one of my professors. Um, she helped me get an internship at a literary agency in Manhattan over the summer. And um, that really kind of helped me see what the publishing world was like. Um, you know, just from reading submissions, it gave me kind of an insight into um, how, how things worked out there a little bit. Um, and then uh, I also worked for Voices Magazine. I don't know if it exists anymore, but um, it was a literary magazine kind of focused on women's writing and um, you know, that also helped me kind of get, get an idea of, you know, what, what editors are looking for, what kind of writing is appealing to people, um, and just working with other like-minded people um, was, was really important. And, and the thing I would say um, is, is uh, that being, um, you know, it takes a while to publish a novel, so all, all the traditional things like networking and meeting people, that can definitely help, but um, it's a lot of time alone in your room just working on your art, and so one thing, one advice I would give beyond, um, you know, pushing those mentors that you have at Duke um, and, and, you know, doing the archive, the chronicle, all those things that I'm sure uh, aspiring writers, you know, you're already doing is just find some friends in your classes that really can be be good readers for you and can be that network for you. Like for example, over the summer right now, um, maybe you had some friends in your creative writing classes that uh, you want to share work with, reach out to them and don't be shy because I was very shy and I didn't, um, or about finding writer friends while at Duke and I wish I had done that. And I think just building that community as early as you can. So when you're, you know, it took me over a decade to publish a novel, when you're going on that journey, you have people who can support you on the way and be readers and um, just, friends for you to, to turn to. Yeah. For sure. I think I've come to learn uh, during my time at Duke that there are so many people who are willing to, um, you know, read over your work and support you um, and just give you the kind of constructive criticism that you really need. Um, thank you both. Thank you. Those are great advice. Um, that kind of also leads us to the second question, which I'm going to direct to Erica, Marco, and Sarah. Um, we all know that getting your foot in the door in the media and journalism industry is very hard, um, especially at this time. So how did you get your head start and what advice would you give for students and alumni trying to break in, into the industry? I, I can start. Um, I was an NBC page and um, the page program is an entry level program for NBC and um, all of the networks, they have something similar. Um, you know, at CNN, we call it the cross-platform program. And what the PAGE program did was it allowed and afforded me the opportunity to look at the different part departments in NBC. And I was a history major. And so I lucked up into the fact that I was a part of the NBC News Specials Division. And that's Whenever you see this is an, an NBC News special report with Lester Holt, there's a whole division and all they do is deal with breaking news. And I know that, I believe Danielle, you were the one that mentioned that you also started in, in breaking news as well. Um, and so from there, that's when I realized that being in breaking news was you know, taking what I really enjoyed, which was history, because everything that I do, I feel like is is, is history, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be history at, at some point. But, um, you know, any sort of an entry level program um, is very helpful. And then finding, I mean, as you've heard from the people on this panel, you know, I've heard ABC, I've heard NBC, I've heard CBS, and obviously I work at um, CNN. And I know a lot of, um, a lot of, um, of current undergrads, they reach out to me all the time and they asked me to help them, to navigate them. To put, I had someone, and Amy knows who it is, it's a woman who's been trying to get a job in Korea, and those jobs are few and far between. And she reached out to me yesterday, and she said, hey, Erica, would you mind reaching out to the HR person for me and um, putting in a good word for me? And I said, absolutely, because I'd met her at a demon event on campus before. And I know her and I feel very comfortable, comfortable enough to reach out to someone. But it is true, you know, getting that email inside the turner.com 
firewall that goes a lot further than someone that's, you know, blind and, you know, calling cold with a duke.edu email address. And so um, I was happy to do it. And so I would just say, use Demon, use your resources, use your network. And I'm sure that there's someone who knows, and I, and I heard you guys mention it before. It's like, even if I went on, I worked at NBC before I came to CNN and I've been at, been at CNN for a long time. But I know people at NBC, so I, you know, if if I can help, you know, I could I could reach out to someone for you. So um, avenues and forums like Demon are priceless, and and use it because we didn't have Demon, as you know, Demon is ten years old, and we didn't have Demon when I was here, and I wish that we did. I can hop in next. Um, talk about how I got started. So senior year, I was fortunate enough to be ahead in my credits so that I could be a part-time student second semester of senior year. And that is something I would highly recommend if you all are in a position to be able to do that. That enabled me to take a job at the Duke News office that paid, um, was a paid position, which was nice. I think it was like 15 hours a week. And then I also was able to do two different internships at local TV stations. And that was very helpful in learning a lot. I was a Spanish and international studies double major journalism certificate, but I'd only had one class in TV journalism. So I really needed some on the ground experience and that was super helpful. And what that also led to that was the most helpful of all was I was working with a photographer one day and he said, oh, you wanna be a TV reporter? You wanna to move to New York City? Because I think at least back then, most Duke students wanted to move to New York City. I don't know if y'all all still want to move to New York City. Um, and so he said, you should reach out to Josh Chapin. He graduated a couple of years ago, and now he's a reporter at a cable station in New York City, and he went to Duke too. And so I just sent Josh, you know, a totally random email um, and said, you know, I'll come up to New York City over spring break to visit my boyfriend, and can I, you know, come meet people at your station? And so I give him all the credit for getting me in the door. Um, I ended up, you know, meeting a ton of people that day, applying to that station, getting a job at that station right after graduating. Um, and that was just huge for me. And, you know, the first job is definitely the hardest to get, at least it was for me. So once I was there, I started off as a freelancer. So just keeping my phone on loud at all times, like sometimes I would get called in at two in the morning, sometimes I would get called in at 8 p.m. It was a crazy lifestyle, um, but that's how I started out and then moved from there to a station in Greensboro and then now landed here at this station in Durham or in Raleigh, but I work in the Durham office of it. Um, and so I also just want to give a plug as you all are considering, you know, what jobs you might be looking for. There are a lot of great positions at network levels, but I also want to give a plug for local news because we need you all in local news. It's so important right now and always, and we are hiring for entry-level positions. So reach out to me if you're interested. Um, I, um, I, I guess I have a kind of a somewhat different um, foot in the door story. Um, I, uh, I started, I grew up in Chapel Hill in Raleigh and uh, worked at the News and Observer through high school as a copy boy, kind of knowing that I wanted to go into journalism. Uh, went to Duke, uh, wrote some for the Chronicle and Tobacco Road, and then uh, went to West Africa to Togo in the Peace Corps. Um, and um, right after, uh, kind of on a lark, I went through uh, Abidjan, Ivory Coast, to the Associated Press office, and they were looking for um, two stringers, one in Burkina Faso and one in Cameroon. And I said, okay, I'll go to Burkina Faso. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to not go back to the States. I'll just stay here. Um, and uh, spent two years freelancing, uh, first for the AP, and then I picked up a string for the BBC. And I'd never done radio, but it fascinated me. And uh, it was a real kind of uh, seat of the pants learning experience. Uh, but it led to a pivot to working as a producer for the BBC World Service uh, in London for uh, a year and a half. Um, which in turn led me to meet the national public radio correspondent at the time, Mike Schuster, who worked at uh, Bush House, which is where the BBC was based and where I was working. So one connection led to another, and that led me back to the States after being six years abroad um, and working uh, in public radio for the first time in the U.S. 
but it was my previous connection at the BBC, my editor there, who was hired to start uh, The World, which is where I work today, where I've been since 1995, since the program started. So um, it's been kind of a, an odd kind of progression, but it's been a step-by-step -step, uh, from West Africa to London to, <laughs> to Plattsburgh, New York, where I worked for four years running a, a small radio station to, uh, to Boston, where I've been since 1995, um, and uh, hosting the show since uh, pretty much since 2002 or so. Um, and I think uh, I've been picking up a bunch of different threads uh, that I would say apply to my own story, but two things that I would take away uh, from my somewhat unconventional path is that it really helps um, even today uh, the BBC Africa service doesn't exist anymore, so I wouldn't be working there. But I would say create a patch for yourself or some kind of specialty that sets you apart uh, in terms of what you cover. Be prepared to be a generalist and also be prepared to uh, speak very specifically about one area. I happen to kind of be in West Africa. That suited me really well. Um, and I think there were two Americans that were working at the World Service when I was there, I was one of them. So it was rare to be given a work permit to even work in the UK at the time. Um, but, you know, just having that specialty uh, got me there, got me two work permits. And I could have gotten a third, but I decided to come back and start this little public radio station, um, which also is probably not something anybody would do today. I mean, uh, the last month has seen a really kind of tragic uh, collapse of newspapers, a lot of jobs have disappeared, and uh, the expectation is that it's only going to get worse. Um, so just footnote, I would say if you are kind of thinking about getting into journalism at this point, be prepared to really see it as a calling and not just uh, a, a job because, um, I mean, I think just hearing what, what Erica was saying earlier, it's been an extremely tough uh, 10 weeks, a very hard story to be covering, and you know, probably um, the biggest story of uh, our lifetimes, probably the biggest story in the last century since the 1918 flu, maybe World War II. So it's something at the level of, you know, medicine or teaching, teaching elementary school, that kind of calling is necessary, I think, at this point. I think the other thread that I would pick up on and certainly applies to my story is just, you know, remember the connections you've made and be nice to everybody who can possibly do you a good turn sometime in the future. Um, it was precisely my connection and uh, my willingness to learn from people who knew more than I did at the BBC that led me back to a program that was executive produced by my editor at the Africa Service. So um, remember your connections, be nice to people um, and uh, you know, make them your friends. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I mean, just about everyone who answered mentioned something about uh, keeping up with connections. Um, Erica mentioned the Duke Network, and I'd just like to echo how um, I think important that is, at least in my experience as a student, um, through the Demon Network and through various like Duke um, programs, I've been able to connect with alumni, and a lot of times you'll find alumni are very willing to help out uh, whenever you need, if you have any, any questions or want career advice. So I definitely encourage people to uh, take advantage of that. And I just wanted to quickly note um, for all of our panelists tonight, um, their email addresses are in the Zoom chat if you just open that up. So if you have any questions um, and you maybe want to follow up or learn more um, from any of these individuals, you certainly can. Um, and I think that also brings us, uh, I mean, it, it, allows us to smoothly transition into the next question for um, Mark and Maureen. How can students and alumni find a balance between networking with alumni about career opportunities during this time while respecting that people may be facing uh, different challenges right now um, in regards to uh, COVID? Uh, well, I guess I'll start. Um... So, I mean, there's no doubt this is a really difficult, challenging, unprecedented time as we're all experiencing. Um, you know, for us at the networks uh, and in every newsroom, you know, we're reinventing how we cover the news on the fly in the midst of something that threatens all of us every time you go out. 
So um, it is. it was chaotic in the beginning. I think things are starting to settle more into a rhythm, at least where I am. Um, and I don't know if that's the case for the other, uh, other shops, but I imagine it is. Um, so it's hard. And I, I think it's going to be a little challenging right now to get people's attention. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying. Um, I was surprised. I, I heard from a Duke student not that long ago, within the last month, I'd say, who was looking to see if uh, CBS still had internships this summer. And, you know, my initial thought was that there's no way that our internship coordinator is even contemplating uh, the future until things settle out right now. And when I reached out to her, I was surprised to learn that she's still taking applications. Um, so, you know, that work is still going on. And um, so every network has people like that, you know, uh, talent recruiters and people who coordinate the internship. So I would definitely encourage everybody if you're interested to reach out. And I would echo what some of the other folks here have said about the importance of internships and networking. Um, I started as an intern at CBS News right out of college, right out of three weeks after I graduated from Duke. And I got that internship thanks to a Duke student, I mean a Duke graduate who was working at CBS and was decided to leave uh, at sort of a, a, a she was working in the political unit in the middle of the 1992 presidential campaign. She had an entry level job and she was going back to law school. She decided to leave um, to go back to law school. And, and, and so she was leaving the political unit in a lurch. And because we had a relationship from Duke, she got in touch with me and said, get your resume ready because um, I'm going to be leaving and they're going to need somebody right away. So I would definitely use the Duke network. Um, and my other piece of advice in terms of just uh, managing how to contact people right now is that you, you do need to be persistent. Like the people that get noticed and get hired um, are the people uh, who, um, you know, they, they, they have a real can-do attitude. Uh, they stay ahead of things. They anticipate needs. Um, like Daniel was saying, they're raising their hands saying, what can I do for you? So you exhibit that attitude in a polite uh Politely, as I say, politely persistent way, um, you can get noticed. Um, and, and finally, I would say, don't just reach out to people for jobs uh, or internships. Uh, reach out for career advice um, or, or just how'd you get how you got started. Uh, I just like to hear your path. Um, so it's not just a conversation about, can you get me a job? what you're saying I think I think that's such a great point because um to your point what you were just saying is you never know when opportunities are going to pop up and just kind of like having a rapport building learning from someone and vice versa um it, like you never know when someone's going to have something there like maybe it's not at that moment they might have not have a job or might they're not might not be an internship but it's you make the connection and then keep in touch I mean some of the students I've met over time um I love following their work one you know maybe they're they don't come to the wall street journal but we stay in touch and it's like you know i start following them on twitter and it's um it's inspiring to see kids students work set their protocol and then from there on out they're just like always on my radar and i always just kind of want to see where they're going from there so i feel like those connections um you know people will try to help in the moment but it's like a long arc um I guess just to start off though, what I would say is I think, and I feel like a lot of people here, I can kind of tell this already and I've had this experience, like it's such a it's such a tricky career and I think everyone felt like they had some sort of break to get their first job for sure and then each one after that. Um, it's a hard career and it, I mean, I love it so much um, that I feel like people have just been so generous in like in such incredible ways with their time and you know, their introductions that I do feel like there's something in journalism, maybe more than other places where like you really do want to pay it forward because you feel like people have just given you so much. So I'd like to, th I've noticed that throughout my career and I, I feel an impetus to do that too. Um, that said during, you know, this time's crazy. As I said, I'm on a sabbatical right now writing a book which has its own time pressures. Also like, you know, homeschooling a six and 10 year old. I'm sure that's other people are doing things like that. Um, it's like this, it, it's a whole nother level of juggling things, um, which, you know, teachers are also amazing. <laughs> Not that we didn't know that before, but uh, I can tell you that much, um, that much more in awe of them. 
so anyway, so please reach out. Um, I think it's a good idea. And as Mark said, just be persistent. And maybe it takes a little while for people to get back to you, but check back in in a nice way, as I'm sure people will. Um, just stay on their radar, and you know, and then and then continue to stay on people's radar. Like over the long term, check back in in a year or so. Like it's a long it's a long career, and I like the idea of um, you know, just the advice. And uh, yeah, as I said, I I feel like I always learn things from students too. I mean, the Chronicle is such an incredible place. Just segueing quick back to what a few other people have said. I worked for the Chronicle my freshman and sophomore year. I did some internships junior and senior year, but it's incredible, I think, once you go into a newsroom, how much the Chronicle mimics one, and not even mimics, like it is a real newsroom. There's so much to learn there. Each internship, I think if I had any regrets from Duke is like, I think you don't realize how I did two internships, one in New York at the local NBC station and one back in Raleigh at the local NBC station. And they were so amazing. I wish I did as many as I possibly could have because you see different things. You see what you like, you see what you don't like. Um, so yeah, that's it's completely uh, invaluable, all those experiences. Thank you both. Um, I think it's definitely excellent advice. Um, yeah, I think it's all about building relationships, uh, just as you guys said. Um, and um, I guess Eva has the next question. Yeah, um, I'd just like to say that I really agree with the whole uh, connecting with the, the alumni point. And I've definitely made connections with alum at Demon. Shout out to Amy for arranging all of that. And also um, the Duke uh, alumni directory is also a very good resource to connect with alumni who you who you might have similar interests with. And also, is there an ad for the Chronicle that we take students um, every year and you don't need prior journalism experience to join if you are interested. And it is, the whole thing is very mimicking a typical newsroom and you get really invaluable relationships and experience. So yeah, come to the Chronicle. Yes, um, and um, great, so diving into the next question, this one is for Winston and Ken. So uh, you've all, you both navigated a variety of uh, media positions in journalism and in similar industries. Um, but what drew you to ultimately pursue the, dire uh, the direction that you finally did? And how does it compare to working other roles or industries? You wanna start off, Ken? And, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I've had a lot of jobs over the years, um, and I benefited from a Duke alumni alumnus to get my first internship. Um, uh, um, when I was when I graduated, I got a um, I got a job at a publication that's long long gone called Swing Magazine that was founded by a Duke grad, um, uh, and it was run by it was a Hachette magazine. I had an internship there, um, and without that. I uh, wouldn't have had the opportunity to get my first job, which was at the Wall Street Journal. Um, and then uh, from there, did freelancing in Mexico um, and then worked at a, a different Dow Jones publication called Smart Money. And then from there, went to um, the Los Angeles Times and now my current job. Um, and, um, you know, I can't speak for everyone here, but a, a lot of journalists, I think, uh, particularly the ones in sort of the harder news area, will tell you that um, uh, it's not always easy to, to necessarily pick exactly what beats or what things you'll cover or where you work, but you keep an eye open to opportunities to pursue the, either the kind of stories or the kind of um, newsroom you want to work in. And so um, I, you know, generally advise people to keep themselves, keep their eyes open to opportunities and not to be afraid to, to move around. Um, some people have really long careers at one publication but I find that increasingly that's not the rule. It's more, more that people um, are, be flexible and be willing to try out new beats or um, uh, new geographic places to be. Obviously that's a little limited right now, but in general being willing to move to a different city or state or even a different country for an opportunity um, can be really helpful. And for me, it certainly was, um, uh, you know, when I moved to LA, I had no intention of ever living in LA, I grew up in Seattle and we used to like, part of the culture of Seattle is hating LA. And so um, 
I never thought I'd end up here, but I had an opportunity to, to have like a real hard news beat, which is something I'd really wanted for a long time. Um, and so I took it and dragged my whole, my, my, my wife and dog across the country at the time. Um, none of, none of them wanted, especially the dog wanted to be in LA, but, um, uh, you know, it, it provided me like new opportunities I wouldn't have had if I'd stayed in the current job I had. And of course you don't know, it's impossible to know what, what if, if you hadn't done something, but I'm, I feel like it was a very rewarding risk to take. And I think being um, open to career risks is, is important, probably in most fields, but I think media particularly, I think um, uh, jumping into, into things that, that you're not sure about, um, can be really rewarding. Uh, that was certainly also the, true for me when I went to BuzzFeed. A lot of people at the LA Times thought I was nuts to go there, um, uh, but I was. I'm really happy with the choice I made. It's it's also been really interesting and um, provided me a lot of um, uh, opportunities and, and experiences that just would have been impossible at a print paper. So um, taking those risks have been great. I'm not sure it's the best answer, but that's the truth. Is just kind of uh, closing your eyes and jumping into the unknown a lot has, has been great. And um, the, I think the fundamental question within your question, like what, what caused me to pursue the direction that I did, I think I always wanted to be in a profession that is, you know, suited to people who are communicators, but in what way I, I had no idea. And I think it was, uh, Danielle, who kicked us off and talked about this, the, just the process of trial and error, the fact that at Duke and then immediately exiting Duke, try it all, you know, try the internships. Um, I live in DC and DC does several things. We do for-profit work, we do nonprofit work, and we get the government sitting here. So during my years at Duke, I actually didn't start looking for media jobs at all. I started working for a nonprofit advocacy group that dealt with, you know, clean water, because I care about that stuff. Um, and I worked in their public affairs department, so it was communicating and it was something I cared about. But after a summer of it, it I, I just felt like, let's try the next thing. Segwayed over to the government the next year. I worked for the FCC, uh, media, but within the government. Um, and uh, that didn't really suit me. It was a little too, too mundane there as well. Uh, worked on the Hill, where a lot of young people were here in D.C. And by that point, I decided that government wasn't really the way to go. So, you know, let's try media internships, because at the Sanford School at Duke, that's really kind of the only way you can pursue journalism as a minor uh, through the policy journalism certificate. Started to build connections there. One of them was a former NBC White House reporter, John Dancy, way, way back when. And uh, he connected me with my first internship at NBC, investigative unit work, lots of research, lots of hands-on stuff, no two days were the same. And after trial and error going through nonprofits and government, that's when I finally found the forum and the love of the kind of communicating I wanted to do. And uh, just to continue ruling stuff out, my final year at Duke, I went to work at ABC 11. Uh, the local station there in Durham, just to try out local news too, because I don't know. And now, you know, working and covering the president for NBC, you know, how did I engineer this whole plan to get to where I'm pursuing the direction I want to follow? I don't know necessarily that this is the direction I want to follow next. Like I, I, I say above all, when you're working in media, just to, just to kind of boing flip off of what Ken just said, don't be afraid to take opportunities outside your city. Don't be afraid to take opportunities outside of kind of your line of work. I'm producing now, but my first job out of, out of um, working at NBC's internships was to accept a, an assignment desk job down in Atlanta with the Weather Channel. You know, Eva, when you asked your question, you talked about the variety of roles uh, and hats we've all worn. Uh, everyone on this panel has talked about it, kind of the odd jobs and the opportunity that they seized when an opportunity presented itself. Um, above all in journalism, I say aim to be a Swiss army knife, aim to gain tools, trades, skills, uh, to make you more and more versatile um, because this business is changing every day. The model of kind of working with a network or a paper and just kind of climbing the totem pole for a whole career, that, that still exists. 
but it's exceedingly rare and people hop around a lot. And I did not think for a second that accepting a job on an assignment desk down south covering the weather for a living when I received a degree out of Duke to cover politics as news out of the Sanford School, did I ever think that that was, I was like, what am I doing here? But then uh, an old mentor of mine at NBC says that sometimes you don't pick the job, the job picks you. And please just gain as much out of it as you can. And as you work in uh, network news, local news on the TV side, um, actually any publication really, you learn the partnership that exists between any assignment desk and any, any producer. It's like the assignment desk is out there gathering the resources, kind of stocking the shelves at Costco and the producers are the ones that put the cogent product on television, kind of taking stuff off the shelves as they need it and putting it into the packages you see and the stories you write and that you read. So everything, everything kind of adds a notch to your belt. Everything adds a tool to your tool chest and that never be shy about even an opportunity that is, uh, it's, it seems kind of off the beaten path. In some way, it will help you, whether it be a person or a skill that you learn. And I'll just say to close that, you know, pursuing the direction and the job I'm in right now, uh, there will be a life after President Trump. And specifically for me, you know, do I want to cover, you know, a Democratic president when we return to normalcy president? Uh, I've actually been thinking that maybe it's time to add another tool to the belt. Uh, in all the roles I've ever held, I've never worked in a control room. Uh, so maybe it's time to move to New York and get in the control room like Danielle gets in there every day, like Mark sees his finished product with Bill Whitaker out of a control room. Um, maybe that's the next step. Uh, but everyone should kind of be asking those questions and uh, continue to aim for that versatility. Thank you so much. Those are great responses. Yeah, I definitely agree that I feel like as do do keys we're all pressured to have this spreadsheet for like to map out our next 10 years they're really just honestly for me i didn't think about doing anything in journalism before coming to duke and now i'm all a media person having done journalism also film took care and documentary class i saw i see you there um, yeah, but really, I think nothing ultimately goes two ways. Everything you learn is ultimately going to help you at one corner or the next. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I definitely echo all that you said. I guess shifting gears a little bit, um, I, I, I feel like a lot of people here are probably interested in how um, the current pandemic is sort of affecting the outlook of the industry right now, or maybe if even your like particular roles, um, how maybe your particular roles have been adjusted. Um, so directing this question to Mangesh and Erica, um, both of you work in sort of different sects of the media industry in a sense. Uh, Mangesh, you work in podcasting, and Erica, you're um, a news director. Um, but how do you both feel um, that or how do you think, I guess, the impact of the pandemic will affect the future of the industry, um, sort of how you're experiencing it? Yeah. Um, Erica, do you want to go first or do you want? I'll go, go ahead. You go. Sure. Uh, I, I feel really lucky that I've <clears throat> stumbled into podcasting and, and it's, um, you know, it's a, a medium that uh, only a third of Americans were listening to, you know, or really indulging in. So there was a lot of space to to grow and, and a lot of audience to to still come to this medium. Um, but I, I think that, <clears throat> I mean, we, we've also been lucky in that it's easy to podcast from where you are. It's, uh, you know, a very democratic format, like it's, uh, you can self-publish pretty easily. So I, I think that, um, you know, our, our listening has been up. Our, our advertising hasn't actually slowed. And um, so it's, it's a strange place to be. Um, but I, I think that what we have noticed is that the shows that are doing best are the ones that provide a real surface, uh, a real service to people and, and something that provides real comfort. And, and so I, I think people are either veering a lot to news or, or they're doing the things that, um, that uh, feel the real intimacy of this medium. And, and unlike uh, video or when I was on various things, like uh, there were so many um, types of media that are just getting streamed at you constantly. And this is so intentional that, that the people who are here are, are not only like 
figuring out where in their day to listen to a podcast, right? Like it's like I, I listen while I walk my dog or I listen while I'm uh, doing the dishes. Um, but they, but it actually becomes a habit. And so for us, it's been a pretty great spot to be in despite the, the real difficulties in, in the ad climate. And for us, you know, everyone that knows um, about journalism and about news, it's all about collaboration and it's all about you know like a working newsroom i mean i mean we work you know two feet from one another and so on a friday we were told that we would be working home on a monday and that just changed everything and also um it changed technology and so you know a lot of reporters who were used to being out in the field when we didn't know what this pandemic was we told everyone that they would be working from home and so they're basically doing um live shots on webex which is very similar to zoom so you know with tech technology had to change and technology had to catch up and so now we have people who are line producing shows from home we have people who are directing shows from home and so that's just a, a whole new way of, of thinking and never when i when i signed up to be an assignment editor when i signed up to be a segment producer and now even in this role that i have now never did i ever think that i would be doing my job working from home and you know we're not going back in um, anytime soon into a building so we've had to actually think of the way we work and collaborate with each other and so you know with my team i'm doing um, WebEx meetings twice a day so we can have pitch meetings and so we can dole out assignments and things like that. So that's one of the things that has changed. And then also just, in, and I'm sure you see it when with reporters who are going out and covering the news, I mean, we have to social distance and we have to um, pertain to the rules and the ordinances of cities, of states, and you know, and it varies. And in place at a place like Florida, for instance, it varies from county to county. So you could be in Broward or Miami Dade, where you have to wear a mask, and then you can go over to the county next door, and you don't have to wear a mask. So it's it's constantly um, keeping current with all of the like the local jurisdictions and what's going on there. And then as journalists, everyone is looking at us. So you want to make sure that you are. <laughs> preach and for journalists that was really really hard because in order to get emotion you want to get up up close and personal and now you see people you know conducting interviews um with a boom mic or you saw you know um when abc news was interviewing the president and they were sitting like you know eight feet apart or something like that and so it's just changed the whole way in which um we cover news and now you know, I'll, I'll share a secret with you guys. You know, sometimes, you know, we're doing live shots with our iPhone 11 because the camera is so good. But, um, you know, that's how we're shooting our live shots now because, you know, we're sending people. And, and when we used to have teams with two and three people, we're now sending one person because we're trying to make our thumbprint a lot smaller when we're covering stories. And so it's just a completely different way of thinking about how you cover the news. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I I agree with that. Like in terms of like just the incredible ways a phone can be used for for um, uh, podcasting. Certainly, like it, it's remarkable what good quality you can actually produce from from the things right around you. Um, the other thing that is that the pandemic has put a stress on. Um, it's reminded people the worth of news, right? And 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 the the worth of quality. And after after journalists have been under such attack for such a while, you realize just from local to, to all types of news, how, how necessary all of it is. And just to jump on that point, it's so important because there's, you know, without naming names or saying anything, there's so much information that's getting out there that's just not accurate. And, you know, as journalists, we feel it's our responsibility to set the record straight and to, 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 get, to get the information out. So what people were saying earlier is like, you know, this is absolutely a calling. And I think people feel so even more now, and it's just so important that um, 
we do get the right information out there and we tell people that it's not safe to, you know, I'm in Georgia, so I will speak for, you know, I will use Georgia as an example. You know, it was too early to open Georgia when they did, when you know for a fact that cases are still increasing. So, um, you know, it is our duty to make sure people are aware with, you know, what reputable institutions like WHO and the CDC are saying and, and to make sure that people are, they have all of the information. I'm not telling you to stay inside. I, you know, it's my job to make sure that when you go outside and you go to Publix or you go to Target that you have all the information so that you could make, you know, an informed decision that, that um, you know, not only is for you, but then ultimately is for your family. And that's what was one of the things when, you know, when governors were saying it's okay to open schools. Well, yeah, but schools are also, you know, schools also employ, you know, maybe children are okay, but schools also employ people over 65. Schools also um, employ people with compromising, um, compromising immune systems. And then when these children go home, they're going home to their grandmothers and they're going home to their parents who may have you know, a, a, you know c compromised immune system. So you just can't open the school because children aren't getting coronavirus, which is not true, you know? And so those are the things that we just have to make sure that everybody knows when they're making the decisions that they're making. Yeah, um, so much. yeah thank you so much. Um, it's definitely a really strange and kind of frightening time, but it has been really fascinating to see how news outlets have been adapting. Um, as well as other media outlets have been adapting to this. Um, uh, we are sort of running low on time, but we do have a few more questions for our panelists. So uh, to all of our guests, we do hope that you can stay with us. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll just keep going forward. Yeah, um, it's great to hear all your advice and responses. Um, so shifting gear a little bit, um, the next question I'd like to direct to Ken and Maria, our two writers on the panel. Um, so looking back at your career, have, have there been times where you have to look for a side hustle to make, make ends meet? And if so, any tips for uh, writers looking for these kind of side, side hustles? And also, how do you manage the time between uh, doing these side hustles and also uh, working toward your ultimate career goal? And also for aspiring writers, do you need an agent to get published? Yeah. Marita, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I would say most of my life has been a side hustle until very recently, until my, my book was sold like two years ago. So um, I straight out, out of Duke, I, I went to a master's program for two years and then in creative writing and then um, for about six years, you know, I did SAT tutoring, um, adjuncting, um, you know, a, like reading essays, reading manuscripts, reading applications to things, um, teaching creative writing summer camp. Um, and uh, then I worked at WikiHow for two years, the how-to article writing company. I did kind of all these things while, um, you know, with the, the goal of finishing a novel. And um, so, you know, I just kind of treated that like my real job and, and everything else was just there to serve that even if I only got to do it like one hour every morning I just kind of told myself that that's what I was doing the whole time um and so while my you know other Duke friends were um having you know more fancy jobs and moving to New York and kind of working uh for different publications like GQ and um, Entertainment Weekly and um, all those kinds of things uh, that's kind of the, the path that I took the dubious path that I took um and so um, I kind of, you know, to kind of get through that and to stay focused. Um, I mentioned having a community earlier. That was really important. Um, I had readers kind of read my work, help me along the way. Um, I started submitting my work to publications. And so that kind of got, got the ball rolling. Um, and I just try to stay patient. And then after um, a while, you know, like eight years of hard writing, I got accepted to the Iowa Writers Workshop. And that was kind of when um, people listened when I, when I tried to, you know, submit my work. It suddenly... Um, I had opened up this whole network of people um, that I kind of began at Duke uh, that who, you know, actually were interested in reading my novel. So between those points, I wrote two books that, that I couldn't get an agent for. And then I came to Iowa with the third book. And that was kind of um, where I, I met my agent and where um, I sold a book and then was able to use that to become an assistant professor. So, uh, so I kind of had basically all of my 20s were, were side hustle. And then um, to, to the question about getting an agent, I would say, 
uh, it, it, you could publish short stories, you know, in literary journals uh, without an agent and that can get an agent's attention and you can go to an MFA program and that can get an agent's attention and you could, um, like I have a friend who just, uh, she submitted a short story manuscript to, you know, a university press contest and it will be published without an agent, uh, but that is kind of, uh, it, the, the way to getting an agent, I think um, it is important to, to publish a book. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so uh, when I was, you know, in terms of side hustles, um, there was a time in, when I was in Mexico freelancing where I was, I really had just minimal income. Um, and it was a bit of a struggle. I mean, Mexico City, back, back this city is kind of glamorous now, I think it was a little bit gritty not as popular a place to live in like the 2001 through 2005 era when I was there. Um, but it was also super affordable and so I could make ends meet, but I was probably, I mean, one year, um, I think I had my entire income was like, you know, under a few thousand dollars for the whole year. So, um, and I was stringing for places that were paying 10 cents, uh, 10 cents a word or, or less. Um, so, um, and for those of you, I mean, some of that's, some of that's going to sound familiar, but for those of you who don't know, um, a lot of um, print outlets will pay you by the word um, as a freelancer. And so we would try to make ends meet by, and this was, there was, there was the internet, but not like it is now. So we would try to sell the same story to multiple outlets, right? So that was like a classic mm -hmm. stringer overseas uh, trick was to sell like, um, yeah, to sell an article to the Portland Oregonian and also to the Christian Science Monitor and also to the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Um, and that would be a way to, to like, you know, turn a nickel into a dime. Um, but things got pretty rough one year and I started um, selling tequila in Mexico as a side hustle. So um, I started um, buying bulk tequila, bottling it and then um, selling it for a while, which ultimately was not a path to, to riches for me. Um, uh, mainly because my, my chief salesman was giving it away. Uh, like he would take it to parties and he was supposed to, you know, get people to want to buy it, but he was constantly giving it away. And I think, you know, getting high on his own supply, as they say. Um, so, so that, that's ultimately what worked was finding a staff job somewhere back in the States where I could, I could have a, a better income. Um, and then writing a book became a side hustle for me in a sense, because I still had my job at BuzzFeed and um, had to take a, a leave as another panelist here, Maureen um, mentioned, I took a leave of absence from BuzzFeed to write the book. Um, and uh, in the middle of that, some big news happened that dragged me back into work. So I was balancing uh, reporting and writing a book with covering what uh, I thought was the biggest story of my life at the time, although as someone else pointed out now, coronavirus probably has eclipsed that. Um, so uh, so I, I couldn't tell what my side hustle and my real real hustle was at that point. Um, uh, but, and, and since then, the book has kind of continued to be a thing where every once in a while, there's, there's little opportunities to to make a couple cents here and there or or to have career opportunities through the through the book, through speaking or talking about it uh, and not getting rich by any means, but certainly meeting people and traveling. And that's interesting. Um, as far as the agent goes, I don't think it, for me, it would have been possible to sell the book without it. Um, uh, I just think that uh, for selling a book, it's a huge advantage. It's kind of a clickish world. Probably Maria would agree with me on this, that, that, um, you know, book people all know each other. Most of them, not all of them are in New York and they have like lunch together all the time. And um, they're intensely aware of their universe and not like super open to like outsiders just barging in and selling a book. So it's, it's much more about getting an agent and having them do the work for you to sell, sell a book. It's frustrating because, you know, they get 15% and you're like, that 15% of all this sweat and effort and energy I put into this and all they did was like have, you know, like lunch with two people and like sitting in a couple of meetings. But Unfortunately, that's that's kind of how it works. And what's even worse is then if some if something great happens with your book and you you sell a movie option or something, they get some of that too, and they didn't do anything to do that. So that's sort of the the world. That's how that works. But that's why you can look for more side hustles. A lot of journalists, for what it's worth, um, teach as a side hustle. Um, uh, some do it as a full time hustle. Um, my former boss quit BuzzFeed to become a journalism professor at USC. And we just found out two days ago, he's coming back to now be the editor of all of BuzzFeed. Um, 
So that's kind of a, that's a thing that happens that people um, use what they picked up in journalism to teach other people. And it's also frequent that people do adjunct teaching um, for journalism. Uh, my little last piece of wisdom on that is that every single person I know that has done an adjunct journalism class has sat down afterwards and done the math and figured out that they that it wasn't economically worth it and they would have been better off like driving an Uber in terms of the time commitment. But I think that that adjunct professing, professorship, those te that teaching has other benefits that maybe are, are not measured in financial ways and it's pretty cool to do. Um, so that's another thing that a lot of people uh, explore as a way to sort of stay, keep their hands in the game and, and support, support their passion in journalism. I think that for anybody pursuing a job in uh, media, it could very well be that having a side hustle is a, a reality. And um, I thank you guys for sharing um, kind of your experience with that. Um, our next question is for Mangesh and Mark. Uh, given the reduction of internship and job opportunities right now, what's your advice for students and alumni starting their own initiatives or creative projects to further their career development? Um, maybe for Mangesh specifically, uh, how has the podcast landscape changed with more people recording podcasts from their closets and kitchens? It seems like everyone wants to have a podcast these days. Uh, what makes a podcast successful um, in such a saturated market? Yeah, I, I can I can definitely talk about podcasts. Um, I, I will say that we started Mental Floss as juniors at college, and then put our first publication on Barnes and Nobles as seniors, and and uh, and ran that company for like 17 years and and we couldn't have done it without a lot of support from duke and looking for where there was money on campus like uh, there's there's so much uh if you're start talking about starting your own initiative I, I i do think that there's um like we realized that every department at the time had little pockets of money to spend on things and so so uh so we went to every head of every department said like you know if, if you like chemistry like it's going to be represented in this magazine that you know and 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 could you give us a small amount and and so the first uh both the first issue we did on campus and and half of what went to the first national issue were were very supported by duke and and i i think there's so much money for like little grants and little um things that you don't even realize like and and you have time like it, it's it's really worth taking the time to like try to explore and and pick your professor's brains for for what what is available but um but in terms of podcasts i i think that um i it is saturated everyone's trying to hop in uh in, into the space my inbox is flooded with pitches uh um but that i i think that uh it doesn't mean that i don't, I don't look for like uh i'm always looking for something um unusual a story i haven't heard or or um like uh, someone else was saying like the um people who have uh, unusual niches uh, uh they're occupying a, a a different space and so um there was a uh duke grad i think 08 rajiv gola who pitched me and and uh and he was in uganda and he's covering this renee box story which is about like a missionary who who um it's it's a bit of a tragic story but but it's really interesting and and uh and he pitched cold and and we really liked it and we saw that it was a story that could be optioned we saw the potential in the story and uh and so even though he'd never done a podcast before uh, that show will launch next friday and and so you know it, it's there, there are still opportunities it's just you have to i think both and he came in asking I, I think when you come in asking for advice and and but have a pitch in your back pocket that that's really helpful uh and to maureen's point like you know um those relationships I, i've definitely followed students in their career as they've gone on and and when people have good ideas i'm still willing to listen you know and so i i think that um the market is saturated but people are always looking for a good quality so sorry i, I realize i'm talking too much the the well, uh, other thing I, i'll say just before I, I get off is is that like i think everyone's looking for instant success and that isn't how it works, you know. Like I, I, I think that you, you you can start a podcast and build slowly, and and uh, and it, it'll grow through word of mouth, you know. And and feeding that relationship with the listener or the customer, you know. And and, and whether it's interacting with them or whether it's you know whatever it is uh, that can make them feel heard and make them evangelize your product, 
you know, and, and having a sincerity there, I, I think we'll, we'll ultimately grow a, a podcast, um, you know, in the end. Um, well, I, I would pick up on something that Winston said a little while ago, which is the, the, the sort of the, the tool belt idea, which is, you know, right now you have an opportunity to really uh, learn tools if you don't know how to sh uh, edit or you don't know, or you can learn how to shoot, you know, you've got a camera in your phone. Um, you know, you can pick up on tools that if you do get into the workforce, when you get into the workforce in a newsroom, you'll be able to use that, or you can try to sell yourself with some of those things that you'll know, you know how to do some of these things. Uh, the technology is there for you to tell a story. And uh, so you can go out and, and try your hand at it. And, um, you know, one of the things about this situation is that because the story is everywhere, uh, you have an opportunity to cover it in your backyard. And I, I worked, before I got to 60 Minutes, I worked um, in breaking news pretty much my entire career. Um, and before, right before I came to 60 Minutes, I was a producer in the Los Angeles Bureau for the Evening News um, for many years. And, you know, we, we like, like, Eric, like Erica's Bureau, we, we covered the Western US, uh, you know, I, I think it was like 14 states or something like that. And if news broke somewhere, we didn't have people in every state. So if you happen, you know, if you're paying attention to the news and you know something pops in your area and, uh, you know, you can call an assignment desk and say, you know, I, I can get over there now and I can find out what's happening. I can scope things out for you. You know, you can offer your services. We used to hire freelance producers um, all the time. So, um, you know, I, I guess my two pieces of advice would be, um, you know, try to jump on news if it's happening in your area and offer your services to a place that you might want to work, um, you know, find an interesting angle or find an interesting story and, and pitch it. And, um, and then just sort of try to learn as many tools as you can uh, so that you have them uh, at, at the ready. Yeah, I think that's a very important question because a lot of people are probably facing the reality of a reduction of opportunities or looking for something to do at home. Uh, the next question is for uh, Danielle and Marie, and it's like a follow-up with the previous questions. But aside from kind of um, individual maybe reporting you can do in your backyard, uh, what online resources uh, or books and films would you recommend uh, that people check out during this time to kind of further de develop their career and to just learn more? Um, and specifically for Marie, um, how have you acquired an the knowledge and skill set to do more specialized reporting. For example, I know you do kind of um, initial uh, IPOs and capital markets, um, and that spe requires specialized knowledge. And yeah. Um, if it's okay, maybe I'll, I'll just start with that. And then Danielle, um, you could go from there. But um, maybe I'll start with that question. So I was an English major at Duke. I was did art history. I was very liberal arts focused. My only um, like economics class at all was Marxism. <laughs> it was like about as close as I got to um, economics, and was like had no interest in like banking. And um, no offense to anyone, but I thought it was like kind of evil um, that people wanted to go to Wall Street. So it's, it's so it's weird to be covering it now. But I had very little background and I basically, um, I worked for like a think tank for two years out of college, really wanted to go into journalism, but couldn't find my, didn't know how to get started, even though I had these internships. Um, so I went to Columbia for journalism school. And then I basically got out and was looking at a lot of different things. And there's this new trade publication called Merger Market that had just started and it covered M&A. And I like barely knew what a merger was. I had to kind of look it up as I went there um so I, I really kind of stumbled into the job um but i was my loans were coming due so i figured i should just get started um so i run i always thought i wanted to call, cover politics but i really completely stumbled into journalism uh, into business journalism and it on some levels i think it was nice being a, a pure outsider because you could look i felt like it opened uh you know i looked at things differently realized how fascinating it was to me and like how many different areas it kind of touched on like you know following the money movements so 
I mean, it's, it was just a very much on the job learning. There's this book called Barbarians at the Gates. Um, I remember one of my editors gave to me and it was like the whole uh, reading about like the takeover of Nabisco back in the eighties, um, the nineties, eighties, I think. And anyway, I just read a lot. I talked to people, asked a lot of stupid questions. People were very nice and uh, talked to me anyway. So yeah, to cover it, it's been, um, you know, it's just been a lot of kind of trial and error, but you just build up the base of knowledge and taking a lot of uh, time to read and just talk to people. And I think there is a certain level, whether it's in business or politics or anything, you know, you, as a journalist, you need the guides anyway. You know, you come at, you're, you're armed with a certain amount of knowledge, but you need a whole lot of different types of people to guide you. Um, you're always going in kind of open endedly asking questions and you don't know where it's going to take you. So anyway, that that's kind of how I got into business and, and so far from anything I even could have imagined find, uh, that I would have found interesting when I graduated from Duke and it's been such a fun ride. And just very quickly in terms of um, what you could do online now, I mean, you have so much time to read time to write but you know there's like for anything that I think you have a little bit of an interest in whether it's um I don't know like photography or even graphic design there's so many different tools you could bring to the table if you're interested in them that could benefit you and there's like a million different resources um for Sarah or I would say sort of let that guide you Yeah, so I'm um, pivoting off of Marine. Um, when I graduated Duke, I didn't have a job, unlike my fellow peers who are, you know, going into law or whatever, it may be finance. And what I did was, you know, I took the time to really focus on the areas that I was interested in. So let's say I was, you know, interested in Good Morning America. I was watching Good Morning America every single day. Um, I was, you know, trying to if you could find scripts, read scripts, see how people are writing. So you can start to learn how people's writing styles are. So then you could start to figure out how you want to write, how you want to craft your own writing style. Um, so I would say just like really consume the content that you're interested in um, from a few different sources too, reputable sources. Um, and then, you know, prepare if you have an interview, if you're talking to um, an alumni or a professor, um, prepare for those conversations like it was a final. So become very read in on um, the materials so that you know who the anchors are or the stories they cover so that you can come prepared uh, with topics that are relevant to the stories that that show that podcast may be talking about. Um, so I would just really say like stay informed and also as part of being a journalist asking a lot of questions. So when you're around the dinner table, seeing what people are interested in, what are people talking about? It just makes you more informed when you go out for those interviews um, that you could bring to the table. Um, Oh, thank you so much. Um, this is absolutely a great time for individuals to continue reading um, from, I mean, not only the sources that they love, but maybe even the sources that, uh, you know, they heard from under, other individuals um, and just continue building their, um, like, skill set and knowledge. Uh, before we continue, I do want to um, say that we do have two more questions before we wrap. Thanks to everyone for sticking around and thank you so much to our panelists. Um, the next question that we do have is, oh, somehow I lost the questions. My apologies. Um, for Winston and Sarah, we'd love to hear an example of a story you're currently working on. What does working from home look like for you during this time? How has it changed your day-to-day -day process and which stories are prioritized? Um, Sarah, how do you build and maintain trust within your community as a local reporter and Winston as a White House producer? And how does inherent partisanship affect your role as a White House producer additionally? Sarah, do you want to jump on that one first? Because you've, you've got the unique process of having to come up with story ideas every day. My story idea is the same every day. It's Donald Trump. 
Sure. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so while you all are looking right now at where I spend like 80% of my day now, um, this is where I do most of my interviews. I do probably 95% of my interviews on Zoom and just screen record them. And then I email that file to the photographer and editor that I'm working with for the day. And he edits it together. And then we drive separately, me from my house, him from the office to meet up at our live shot location and do the live shot and say goodbye. Um, so I never thought as a journalist, I would be someone who was able to work from home. And so while the circumstances are of course, terrible circumstances, it's been an interesting perspective to start working from home and realizing that I still have no free time. Like I had all these expectations of like, oh, I'm gonna do the laundry and like cook all my meals, all the, you know. Um, I just ate a frozen pizza. I had to put my video on mute because that's my life. Um, but it's, yeah, so let me think um, back to the questions. How has it changed your day-to-day -day process? Yeah, so I do have to pitch stories every day, um, but in these times, it, there is just a wealth of stories. So that has not been an issue. What's been more of an issue is figuring out which ones to do because there's just not enough time in the day to do all of them. Um, but I operate very much on a day-to-day -day basis. So like, I don't know what I'll be doing tomorrow. Um, and that's the norm. So I start my day at nine and I wrap it up by six and put a bow on my story. And then the next day is a new day. Um, so I've been doing a lot of stories about, you know, city stay at home orders, local stay at home orders versus state stay at home orders. Today I did a story about concert venues and how they're planning to reopen and what that will look like. Um, and then to answer the last part of the question about building trust, I would say that especially in local television news, there are a lot of people who are constantly trying to climb the ladder. So they'll go to one city for two years and then move on and move on. And I think, you know, while that is something that is a reality and that happens, I think it does show when there's someone who is actually invested in the community. Um, and I'm really invested in Durham, obviously went to Duke, back at Duke again, my husband went to Duke, then he went to Duke again. Um, and we love living in Durham, we bought a house in Durham. Um, I've been working at my current station for about four years, which is a long-ish time, surprisingly, um, in local TV news for reporters. So I think that's how I've been able to work on building trust is just by showing like, hey, I'm not just your reporter like I'm your neighbor and this is my home too and I love it and I'm looking out for you all and for the best for all of us um, so if you can find a place you love to live and find a job you love it's just ideal um, so part of me is actually kind of worried that you know executives of all types are going to start to see how we're working now and how we're doing a real yeoman's job because uh, news is being consumed a lot more than we're used to, at least in terms of TV ratings. Um, NBC Nightly News is getting almost like 1.5 the viewership it used to. And they're averaging like over 10 million viewers uh, a newscast. Uh, there's people are just really, really digesting news and we're doing this huge story, uh, basically all from our homes. Um, and, uh, you know, the economy is kind of suffering all across the board and executives will start to take notice, I think, of how we've been able to tread water in this way with the staffing where it is, the furloughs and uh, the hours cut down. So, you know, it's actually going to be kind of weird when stuff gets back to normal and when there's not a need for me to be at the White House physically or on a plane going to a campaign rally or something, the idea of going back to NBC's bureau is going to be foreign to me. Do I have to? Do I have to go all the way in, or can I just continue to, you know, watch everything from my pajama? Um, so I don't know what that's going to look like afterwards, uh, as as people make those decisions way, way, way above me. But it's been a pretty, it's been a pretty cool process to be able to uh, have the functionality uh, that I need to follow the president and everyone at the White House from my from my uh, living room. Um, uh, just uh, maybe a helpful thing is to just kind of put it in perspective. Like we'll, we'll take a take a little example of, you know, uh, 
Kellyanne Conway or something is on is on was on Fox today uh, talking to Harris Faulkner about a bunch of bunch of topics. And uh, you know, hey Winston, make sure that you can you can tell everyone what went on in that interview and and so that we know what's what's important and what's not. So I'm I'm on my couch. Uh, I have my TV on and I'm watching Kellyanne talk to talk on Fox, and taking notes as it's going along. And I have one of my mobile devices uh, recording every word she's saying on Fox. So one device is kind of auto transcribing what she's saying on Fox. And on the other phone, I have a video that's showing, you know, a live stream of a stakeout camera outside the West Wing. So that when she's done on Fox and she just walks right over to that camera, it's like she walks from Fox's screen onto my phone screen for the stakeout. And then I take that other phone that I was using and I just start auto transcribing from the stakeout and I'm on my laptop taking notes on everything she's saying that's noteworthy. And then I, I, I turn out the news so that people can take the, you know, 40 minutes of time on Fox and at the stakeout that Kellyanne just said and digest it into what you need to know. Um, and we did that for the president several times today. We, we, we're going to be doing it for uh, Pence is on Hannity right now. Uh, I don't have to do that, obviously, because I'm here, but someone is in our team. And just the functionality of being able to do this at all, all at home is, um, it's been, it's been pretty mind blowing. Um, as for, as for the second question about how, as a producer, kind of how does, um, the inherent very partisan climate affect what I do. Um, you just kind of have to, what I have to remind myself of is that the relationship with the press in, in past presidencies, it's maybe in some ways it was more simpatico because even though no president likes a negative headline, at least when the negative headline comes out and you read the you read the copy in the paper, you watch the report on television and you're hearing facts presented to you, you go, well, can't argue with the facts. Um, this is a different climate with a president who likes to disregard and uh, uh, disrespect the press, um, especially when he perceives a report to be negative or unfair. You just kind of have to keep doing your job and kind of stay above all that uh, because the second you start to say, you know, well, how can you get accusatory and say like, how can you say that our reporting is, you know, these anonymous sources are fake or they don't exist. It, then you start to inject yourself into the story and that's, that's just not constructive for anyone involved. So you kind of have to just kind of call the balls and strikes as you see them, uh, present them as the facts you see them. Uh, and, and the administration will dispute it, but you know, that's, that's their right. That's their prerogative. But, uh, every news organization that I've, I've worked with has a very rigorous process of checking and double checking with multiple people and not just relying on hearsay or single hand information uh, from a single source, I should say. And, uh, uh, just keep in mind that every president's relationship with the press has been adversarial. Uh, this is just, it feels like a slightly different time, but you are doing your job. If I had a producer colleague tell me this, uh, who works out of the Pentagon, you're doing your job. If you put a, a story that you know, you've rigorously checked out there and someone from your beat in an official capacity sends you a pissed off email afterwards, you've done your job. Um, uh, cause you're holding them accountable. So, uh, the long and short of it is that that's, that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely think that journalist jobs are now more important than ever. Um, yeah, and so finally, our last question. Sorry about the time over. Um, this one's for Maureen and Marco. Um, so Sarah and I working at the Chronicle know that, uh, at least for the Chronicle, we're cutting a lot of uh, print days and mostly, uh, mostly moving everything towards a digital first model. And we're wondering if that's the general trend um, in this industry for major uh, news outlets. And, um, and because of that, our media company is looking for um, a significantly different skill set involving more of this kind of digital production skills. 
And uh, would you recommend um, Duke students, current undergrads, uh, developing those kind of skills to be a better candidate in the job market? Um, we've had an interesting evolution with the Digital First uh, at the world because uh, as a public radio program, we are kind of de facto a, a radio show first. Um, but we always had kind of the world.org uh, as, as a website that was really kind of representing the show, but also if you wanted to, you could listen to the show at the world.org. Um, a lot of that has changed uh, with podcasting. We've been podcasting the show uh, in a kind of, you know, so that's slightly digital, but um, the challenge has been over the last 10 years to integrate both the, the web team and the radio team into one single newsroom. And we occupy literally the same space, although we don't now be, because everybody's off site. Um, uh, we um, acquired uh, through uh, WGBH, uh, an international newspaper called Global Post, which was based in Boston um, uh, for a number of years. We brought them, they were, they were digital only, and we brought them into the newsroom. So that kind of forced our hand in trying to figure out how to incorporate um, the world.org and the world itself as a radio show. Uh, that has become much more successful and uh, we have found kind of like the, the website will pick up and do completely different stories from what we do on the radio. Um, and that's just become more and more integrated over the past four years or so. Um, in terms of skill set, I mean, the, the skill set for radio is simply you've got a really high quality tape recorder, which sees all well, digital recorder, flash recorder these days, which is, um, you know, 200 bucks, a decent microphone is 200 bucks and you're off and running. Um, since uh, COVID-19, just a side note, uh, all the radio reporters I know in the Boston area have done a rush on uh, hockey sticks. They tape the mic to the end of the stick and that's about six feet. So that's where all the hockey sticks have gone in, in the Boston area. Um, uh, the skill set, you know, digital photography, digital uh, audio, video, uh, all of that was non non-existent when I left Duke. Um, you either picked radio, TV, or print, um, and you kind of w went for that. Um, so the skill set has changed. I would say, you know, the basics kind of remain the same. It's get it first, but get it right. Um, we uh, all need to be able to work on deadline as journalists, daily, weekly, whatever your deadline is, and getting the facts right. Um, that hasn't changed at all. Um, I guess in terms of my big question is like, what now in terms of skill set? Because uh, again, you know, where I'm speaking from is where I did the whole show today, um, as I've been doing for the past six weeks. Um, is this kind of going, is this current workflow going to be the permafrost, going to be in permafrost now? How much of this are we going to keep? And how much of this is going to demand new skill sets? Or maybe jobs will be eliminated. I just saw a clip the other day of a BBC correspondent in Mumbai and he got his grandmother uh, to run the lights and the camera for him as he sat there. So it's like, do we really need, you know, high paid, high skilled people? I mean, I would argue yes, because otherwise the whole profession, the whole industry is going to collapse. But, um, you know, I, we have people who are doing local TV shows at the GBH. Uh, they, you know, usually have a crew of like 10 people. They're doing it all by themselves now. So, um, that then leads to the question, how much more are, you know, big media corporations going to consolidate and how much are smaller ones going to kind of disappear? Um, I know right now there's a big panic among small public radio stations, uh, local fundraising, local underwriting has dried up in the last six weeks. Um, that's the money they use to buy programs like ours. So what does that mean? Um, so those are the skills <laughs> that I'm kind of worried about right now. Um, yeah. Um, Marco, to your point, I mean, what I really, one point you made, think there, in some cases there's like an over, um, I wouldn't worry, to, these, some of the skills that you all will have, especially the people who are um, undergrads now, you, you naturally will be so much further ahead of like me and, um, you know, a lot of people in a newsroom just what you have at your disposal um, and the things you do in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
I, but I think I still think at the end of the day, the more important skill set is to be like a really good storyteller, a, a good writer, and a good um, you know really like scrupulous about your fact checking, and a good a good communicator, a good um, you know sourcing, like building connections with your sources and making people trust you. Sarah, I, I thought your point was really important, like just being trusted in your community. It's like you you need to be trusted by your sources. I think no matter there are other skills that are in, are good to have, but I think if you don't have those, um, I mean, some one thing at the Wall Street Journal is like the like the word correction is like the like the most terrifying word you could ever like hear like having to correct something. It's like there's some level of like being detail oriented um, that I think all that comes first and is so important and finding good exciting stories and the the great thing I think right now is like there isn't this divide that there used to be in terms of like are you going to be a print reporter are you going to be do you want to be on radio do you want to be on tv it's such an exciting time to be if you could tell a good story um you can go I mean at the wall street journal now you write I mostly write but I write a story and then now we have our daily show the journal you go on and it's really I mean we have a really amazing team um you know that does all the legwork and draws you out telling your story to the producers and um yeah and then there's tv opportunities so i think it's just exciting but i do think this the most important skill set i is the storytelling being really careful developing sources and everything else is gravy but if there's also if there's stuff that you really like, I mean, newsrooms do want innovation. We have a whole innovation team. I know most other newsrooms do. So if you're if you're really talented at graphics and have these ideas, you'll be a res you'll be uh, have I think a lot of opportunities to do that too, a huge and a big asset to the newsroom. So I think there is a certain ex to a certain extent your other ta your additional talents depending on what they are and what your your interests are. You could find places to deploy them within a newsroom. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists. It's been an incredible opportunity to be able to hear from all of you uh, this evening. Uh, thank you for our guests for sticking around and um, attending. Um, just a few announcements. Um, we hope that you'll join us next week for two more Demon Live episodes, uh, the business of entertainment and marketing. Um, branding and influencers. There's more info in the chat. There are some links where you can sign up. Um, and also there, uh, don't, don't forget that there are also um, in the chat, the email addresses of all of our panelists in case you have any additional questions, want to follow up, want more information. Um, and we'll also be sending a follow-up email as well with all of this information. Um, yeah, so we hope you all stay safe and well, and thank you again for coming. And thanks to our moderators. Great job, Sarah. Great job, Eva. Yes, thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. Have a great night. I so appreciate each and every one of you. Stay safe and well. Take care. Bye. Good night.